Praise the Lord, then. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> Thank you, Choir. Will you turn to the book of Ephesians this morning? The book of Ephesians, chapter 6. And we'll read from verse 10. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord 
and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, a personal note, Paul says, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which, here's a wonderful expression, I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Father, this morning, shut each one of us in with yourself. We're here with our problems, our anxieties, our difficulties, our moods, our temperaments. Father, the Holy Spirit can solve them all. And I'm asking that he will come this morning and take his word and bless it to our hearts and bless us in spite of ourselves and lead us on with your lovely self. Let your holy and precious name be glorified. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesian believers, he wrote it from a cell where he was chained to a Roman soldier to show that he was a very special prisoner. In fact, a maximum security prisoner. But before that, he was, we are told by Dr. Luke in Acts 28, he was in a hired house for two years. A lot of people forget that Paul was a Roman citizen. He wasn't crucified. They only crucified slaves. But he was beheaded. Mm. Peter was crucified. The rest were crucified because they were looked on as slaves. But Paul was a Roman citizen. And while he was there, he was under house arrest for those two years then. <coughs> he appeared before the Senate. <coughs> And they then would give a ruling, <clears throat> and from there he was transferred to this particular cell. Night and day, the soldier was there to ensure that Paul would not escape. But knowing Paul and his love for the Lord Jesus and his love for the souls of men, Paul and that Roman soldier would gradually become friends. <laughs> I'm sure that soldier who guarded him for many months could really tell you about this little man who was his prisoner. Think of it this morning. He saw Paul in worship. He heard Paul in prayer. He took Paul to the toilet, brought him back from the toilet, <coughs> chained <coughs> to Paul. Listen to him counseling. The many friends who came at the beginning of his prison sentence to see him in that house, and he saw his tears and sincerity and finally witnessed his death. We don't know who Paul's prison keeper was, but <clears throat> for years after Paul's execution, that Roman guard would think of the little man he was chained to night and day. Think of the Savior 
that he worshipped. Or maybe better still, Paul's personal jailer had trusted Paul's Savior. Who knows? But here's what I'm thinking this morning. Maybe this Roman soldier chained to his wrist night and day gave Paul the lovely thought that the child of God was a soldier of Jesus Christ. Mm. Paul would see him night and day. Watch his armor. Watch how he dressed. Mm. The soldier, the armor that the soldier wore was a picture of the child of God's armor as he was battle against the child of God's threefold enemy, the world, the flesh, the devil. Mm. And sisters, don't think that you are excluded from this because you are in the Lord's army this morning. One of my visits to Israel, I saw many young women who were dressed in khaki, dressed as soldiers, spoke to them, witnessed to them. They were called up from the age of 18 to the age of 21. They were trained for emergencies. Mm -hmm. And so, brothers and sisters, we are soldiers in the army of Christ. And that's why he wrote verses 10 and 11, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But notice how he emphasizes twice in verses 10 and 13 the term, the whole armor of God. Mm. The whole armor of God. So Paul is saying, God has provided a defense and a protection for his people with the armor he has given them. So let's for a moment, a few minutes, examine this armor. If you are defeated this morning, it's because you're not wearing the armor. If you are defeated this morning, it's because you don't know how to use the armor. Mm -mm. This is what Paul is saying. Mm. If you're defeated this morning, you're not wearing the armor. Mm. First, there is the belt. The belt. Mm. The belt of truth. Paul says, verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt or belted, as the Greek New Testament puts it with truth, mm. it was the belt which girt in the soldier's tunic and from which his sword hung that gave him freedom of movement. Mm. It's not amazing the belt didn't hinder you. The belt gave you freedom of movement. Mm. This was a picture of the freedom <coughs> of the child of God while others would question and query. The child of God could move freely and quickly because in any situation, he knows the truth. The belt of truth in any situation. He knows the truth. I don't care what's happening in your home this morning. I don't care what's happening in your business. I don't care what's happening in your university. I don't care what's happening in your school. If you're having problems, you should know the truth because you are belted with the truth. Mm -hmm. You see, this is the secret of the whole armor of God. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Lord Jesus said in John's gospel. He says, you shall know the truth mm. and the truth shall make you free. Mm. He said that in John 8. Uh, and what a strong believer you will be if you will learn to know the truth and in the truth and have your life belted with the truth. So here we have the belt. The second piece of armor is the breastplate. I'm going through these quickly. Every one of them can make a study for every night. Mm -hmm. But the second piece of armor is the breastplate. The breastplate, right here. See, right here. Mm -hmm. And Paul is saying righteousness is a breastplate. Mm -hmm. Righteousness. Not only imputed righteousness, not only imparted righteousness. We could get into the theology of that. But right living. Mm -hmm is the breastplate. Mm. That's what Paul is meaning here. 
When a man is clothed in righteousness, he is impregnable. Brothers and sisters, mere words are no defense against accusations, but a good life is. (laughs) Right living is. Look at me this morning. Mere words are no good against accusations, but a good life is a good testimony. Mm. If you lose your testimony, you've lost everything. Mm. You can have all the gifts in the world. You can have all the prosperity in the world. If you lose your testimony, brother, if you lose your testimony, sister, it'll take you a long time to regain it. Mm. Mm. So that's why your testimony is the most important thing in the world. In fact, it's your testimony It's going to be one of the means that you will be in the rapture, if I may use the word rapture. We're hearing a lot of talk about it these days. It's an unscriptural term, but we'll use it anyway. Mm. Right living by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death because he had this testimony Mm. that he pleased God. Mm. Every one of you this morning, including myself, we have a testimony. Plato, the philosopher, was once accused by a man of certain crimes and sins. Well said, Plato, and I think this is brilliant, we must live in such a way as to prove that his accusations are all a lie. (laughs) Isn't that brilliant? He says we must live in such a way (laughs) that all his accusations will be proved that it's a lie. The only way to meet the accusations against Christianity is to show how good a Christian can be. And that's what Paul is saying. The breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness, right living, should be the hallmark of every person who professes the name of Christ. You're listening very well to me. I know from the Spirit I've got your attention. Thirdly, Verse 15, we have the feet. Oh yes, the feet, says Paul. The feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, or as the Greek text says, the sandals. The Roman sandals was not just sandals that you wear when you go to Tenerife or when you go to Spain. These were special sandals. These were not holiday sandals. The sandals. The sandals were the sign of one equipped and ready to move. The sign of a real child of God is that he is eager to be on his way to speak the gospel and to share it with others who have not heard it. So Paul says, have your feet shod. Note the word with a preparation of the gospel of peace. These are surely the feet of a herald, shod for swift and ready movement. This is a picture of a cheery courier, bright in his alertness, prompt and ready to carry abroad the good news of redeeming grace. He is like a man whose feet are nimble, whose shoes are exactly the right size and shape, fitting him like a glove, giving giving him comfort and freedom, enabling him to stride on any road and walk all day without fagging. And that was the mark of the Roman soldier. He could walk all day without fagging because his feet were shod with the preparation. This is the, this is the simile that Paul is using for us this morning. And you know yourself, is there anything more harassing and more embarrassing than in ill-fitting shoes that are loosely tied? Is there anything more wearing than shoes that pinch and cripple you? I hate new shoes. Here's the way I am um, for weeks. And I'm in the house and I'm pulling them down this way and that way. And I've got a pair of shoes now that, that fit me. And you know, I feel so much for weeks there. The shoes I was wearing were a dead loss. And people were saying, you need a pair of shoes. There's a brother here. And he saw me with an old pair of shoes one night down in Bellamina. And they were cracked and everything because they were comfortable. And you know, God love him. He gave me a couple of hundred quid. And he says, go and buy yourself a pair of shoes. But, but you see, it's because these shoes were ill-fitting. They are dead weight to all your movement but to have the right shoes wedded to your feet in perfect union, they almost 
add wings to your feet. Mm. They almost add wings to your feet. This is the simile which is used to describe the feet of the herald of the Lord. Whitewell needs these shoes and needs these sandals. Whitewell needs shod with a preparation of the gospel of peace. How soon can you be ready? Said Gladstone to General Gordon when he proposed to send him to the Sudan. He says, I'm ready now, said Gordon. It got the train that night to Dover. <clears throat> That's the shoes of a herald. I think God is calling me. Nonsense. If you think he's calling you, he's not calling you. Mm. You know when God's calling you. Listen, the one who holds the world in his hand is able to communicate to you. Can I hear a praise the Lord? Mm. And if he calls you, <coughs> are you ready? For a number of years in the old church, there was a couple used to come, you know, and they were going somewhere in Europe. And uh, of course, their family belonged to us and said, uh, they're coming to talk about what the Lord has called them to do. And I would give them an offer and, and that was okay. And then they came the next year and they were saying what the Lord had called them to do and I gave them an offer. And the third year they came and they said what the Lord called. I says, have you gone yet? <laughs> I felt like saying, give me my money back. <laughs> That's the truth. I felt like saying, you're a waste of space. <clears throat> Give me your money back. <clears throat> but Gordon went to Sudan and you know what happened to Gordon. And that's the way this church should be this morning, on the alert. <clears throat> on the alert. And this is the feet of the herald. Then fourthly, there was the shield. <clears throat> Verse 16. <clears throat> but notice the language of Paul describing this shield. He says, above all. <laughs> above all. What does that mean? Don't forget. Mm. If you forget everything else, don't forget this. Mm. Mm. Don't forget yeah. the absolute necessity taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench some, no, all. Notice the positiveness of Paul here. Quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. <clears throat> now the, the word that Paul uses for this word shield is not the usual word that is used for the comparatively small round shield. It's the word for the great oblong shield which the heavenly armor warrior wore. And listen. Look at that door. That was the shield Paul was talking about. Look at the door sitting behind you. The shield was like a door. <sighs> Taking, covered you from top to bottom, covered your very feet. A door. In other words, the Roman soldier carried a door. And when they advanced, they advanced with a shield, the second row, the shield above their heads, the third row, the shield behind their back. <sighs> impregnable mm. fantastic mm. and Paul calls it the shield of faith and one of the most dangerous weapons in ancient warfare was the fiery dart it was a dart tipped with tow dipped in pitch and the pitch soaked tow was set alight and the dart was thrown but the great oblong shield was the very weapon to quench it just held it up and quenched it. Mm. The shield was made of two sections of wood glued together. And when the shield was presented to the dart, the dart sank into the wood and naturally the flame was put out. And what was Paul saying? He was saying, faith can deal with the darts of temptation. Faith to Paul was a man's close relationship with Christ. Mm. Mm. See, we talk about faith. Faith in God for miracles. Oh, this is the way they get off. Come off it, brother. Faith is your relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
How close are you to him this morning? Did you talk to him this morning? Did you worship him this morning? Did you love him this morning? That's what faith is about. It's not an abstract thing. And that was Paul's faith. It was his personal relationship with Christ. Christ was before him. Christ was beside him. Christ was behind him. And Christ was above him. Can I hear a praise the Lord? What a shield. Give me a scripture. An old boy called Abraham. What God said, Abraham, I am thy shield. I am thy shield. And thine exceeding great reward. Can I hear a praise the Lord? Follow me. Hands up here and join the word. It's lovely, these things. <clears throat> Just picking them out and throwing them at you. And then fifthly, there was the helmet. Verse 17, the helmet, he calls it of salvation. Now, this is the one that troubles me. I'm speaking personally. Of all the armor. I need this helmet all the time. Because my mind, wow. If you knew what my mind was. Davy McClure says it's like a computer and different of my pastors say, my mind is terrible. Even when I'm sleeping, I'm thinking. <laughs> I just say, Lord, would you give my mind peace? And you know, I was praying the other day and I went into my bathroom and was throwing water around my face and the Holy Spirit said to me, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stead on thee. But then I says, what, well, Lord, that's a cop out. If I just think about you all the time, what about the problems in white? Well, what about problems with men? What about problems with women? What about problems with this? What about problems with that? Back came the answer in my spirit. If your mind is on me, I will give you the solution to your problems. Can I hear a praise of the Lord? Isaiah says, thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stead on thee. Now the helmet, the helmet protected the head or the mind. And do you know one of the weakest places or areas of the child of God is his or her mind? The mind has always been a great battlefield and a minefield. You're thinking about a man and, and you think he's against you and you think he's this and he's thinking that. And maybe the man is as innocent as can be. It's your mind. <laughs> You think in the home about your child, sister, and you're worried about him and this and that. It's your mind. It's your mind. Put your mind with Christ this morning. The devil is battling for the minds of men and women. That's why we have psychiatrists and humanists and all these people about. And don't do anything for your mind. Just open a can of worms and a crawl out. I point people Godward. Thou will keep him. Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stead. Stead, stead. Stead on thee. But notice what the helmet is called. The helmet of salvation. God's helmet is peace. God's helmet is purity. God's helmet is his presence. That's the helmet Where's your mind this morning, brother? Where's your mind this morning? Where's your mind, sister? <clears throat> what sort of thoughts do you allow to go through your mind? I'm not just talking about filthy thoughts. I'm not talking about sewer pipe thoughts. Okay, all those things happen. But stupid thoughts. Dopey thoughts. Judgmental thoughts. Those are the things that trouble me, not the sewer pipe thoughts. I can deal with them. I can deal with the dirty thoughts. I can deal with all that. It's the doopy thoughts. Because you're looking at people and you're listening to people. And so you've got to get yourself in the estate with God that he can deal with your heart. Can I hear a praise the Lord? You're listening to me and I know I'm getting to you. That's the helmet. Where's your mind this morning? Jealous thoughts, evil thoughts, wrongful thoughts, suspicious thoughts. Oh, those old suspicious thoughts. How they ruin you in your relationship with a brother and with a sister. Suspicious thoughts. 
Those are rotten old thoughts. Hard thoughts. Hard thoughts. We all get evil thoughts. Remember what Martin Luther said about evil and wrong thoughts? Young students came to him and said, what about these thoughts that go through our head? And what Luther said, we can't help the birds flying over our heads, but we can help them make a nest in our heads. Can I hear a praise the Lord? You can't help the birds flying over your head. As long as they don't bomb you. <laughs> you can't help the birds flying over your head, but you can, you can help them and forbid them making nests. And that's what we need, God's helmet salvation. When you go out to work tomorrow, put on the helmet. <clears throat> Some of you are going out cycling tomorrow, put on the helmet. When you go out in the motorbike, put on the helmet. But all of us, when we go out tomorrow, put on the helmet. Can I hear a praise the Lord? I'm watching the clock. Number six, there was the sword. Verse 17, the sword. Oh boy. He says, he calls it the sword of the Spirit. Not lovely. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And Hebrews chapter 4 tells us it's a two-edged sword, <coughs> piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. What a sword! Uh, I'll be using it tonight. The uh, sword of the spirit. Somebody is talking about Lauren. The blessing it was the other night. And it's lovely. And they said, Lauren has a reputation for hardness. I says, aye, but the gift of God doesn't know what hardness is. Can I hear a praise the Lord? That gift of, that God has placed in this house to reach souls. Have you said to the Spirit, what's hardness? He says, what's hardness? He doesn't know what hardness is. They yield to his moving. Can I hear a praise the Lord? Imagine a soldier without a sword. <clears throat> Did you bring your sword with you this morning? Oh, well, now we put the word on screens and all, but I like to see people bringing their sword. Let people see you carrying it. Bring your sword this morning. A sword is used for two things, for defense and for attack for defense, and for attack. Mm -hmm. Every child of God here this morning should know how to use the sword. And it is a duty of every real servant of God to show and train his people in the use of the sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The greatest and best example of one using the sword of the Spirit. Do you know who he was? Our beloved master, the Lord Jesus, when he was tempted in the wilderness of the devil. And three times, Satan cunningly attacked him. But three times, the Lord Jesus repelled him with, it is written. And look at the skill of the Lord Jesus in using the sword. He didn't quote Genesis to Malachi, as some preachers would do, or from Matthew to Revelation and spray, spray tacks all over the place. He just lifted three simple tacks out of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, chapter 10, and willed them. Can I hear a praise the Lord? See, he knew. He knew how to use the sword. He knew how to use the sword. And that's enough to defeat the devil and send him skulking away. It is written, that is the sword. Let's learn it, let's study it, and let's use it for the glory of God. The man who wrote about the sword of the Spirit <coughs> was, of course, a master swordsman himself, taught by the Lord Jesus. Listen to what he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Study, study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Didn't say study, Timothy, to show yourself approved unto men. We men marking your exam papers and calling you doctor or calling you BA or MA. We, we men. But pastor, you're a doctor. I know, but I didn't want it because when the professor of the university in California said I was getting it. I says, I thought divinity never needed a doctor. 
He says, you're a doctor of divinity. I said, thought divinity never needed one. <laughs> That's what I think of these titles. <laughs> I don't think much of them. But here Paul says, study to show thyself approved unto God. You see, the school of Hillel and the school of Shammah rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Those were the universities of our Lord's day. But on the banks of the Jordan, the Father's voice said, This is my beloved one, in whom I am well pleased. Can I hear a praise the Lord? Study to show thyself approved unto God. Now listen to this bit. And this is the bit that I cringe with some preachers when I watch on TV and I watch in different things. He says, a workman, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Mm. Now there's handling the sword mm. and handling it well. Mm. The silence in this place is powerful this morning listening to God's word. The armor is wonderful, but the sword is wonderful too. Seventh and finally, hands up here and join God's word. Seventh and finally, verse 18. The greatest weapon of all, prayer. Shout it out. Shout it out again. See us tomorrow night. Mm. 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 Prayer. Prayer. I was taught in the Iron Hall, the weakest, the devil, what is it? The devil what? Trembles when he, the weakest saint, upon his knees. How can I stand? Get on your knees. How can I defend? Get on your knees. Because when you're on your knees, you're standing. But anyway, did you notice prayer is the seventh part of the armor and seven is God's number. It is, number, it is his number for completion and perfection. And the armor has seven parts, thus making it a perfect armor, a divine armor, a complete armor. The child of God that puts this armor on will win the day. But as I close this thought, let me deal briefly with the seven piece of armor which Paul calls prayer. Now we must note three things that Paul says here about prayer. He says it must be constant. Say constant. He says praying always, praying always. Just don't need, by all means go into your room and pray. By all means go out and walk and pray. But you can pray in the car, you can pray shopping, you can pray. Just keep talking to God. You're talking to people, keep talking to God. Keep talking to him, praying always. Mm. Bad times and good times and dull times, exciting times. Believers seem to only to pray at the bad times and the, the, the need times. But Paul says we must have a life of prayer. Prayer to me has always been, and you can borrow this from me, because I do this. I go into a season, I don't want to talk to anybody, I don't want to answer the phone. I nearly tell a lie, I'm not, I'm not available. Mm. Because I'm talking to God. Mm. And that's important. That's important. As you know, I don't go on holidays. I'm going, I'm going to Texas, but I'm letting you know that. I'm going to see my two friends before I die, okay? But uh, as you know, I don't go on holidays, but I, I go away. I go away in my mind. Mm. Mm. And I start seeking the Lord. Mm. And uh, prayer to me has been making a lodgement or a deposit at a bank. And in that season, I'm making lodgements, making deposit. Here you are. Take that in. Put it on my account. Here you are. Take that in. Put it on my account. Here you are. Take that in. Put it on my account. And then I'm busy. And then when something happens in Whitewell, I go to the bank and say, I want the lodgement out. But you've got to make the lodgement before you pull it out. <clears throat> Can I hear a praise the Lord? 
You've got to make the lodgement before you take it out. If you went to the bank and you didn't make any lodgement and said, I, I want 50 pounds, he says, your, your check's overdrawn. Your check is bounced. No, you make your lodgement and this is what you do. And in times of stress and need, we can come back and draw on it. Paul believed in the same principle. Then it must be intense. He said, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. We must have the Spirit of prayer, praying with power. Say, Pastor, I, but I say the same old things. So do I. Hands up who says the same old things when they're praying. And you say, Lord, am I boring you? No, you're not. You're just boring yourself. <laughs> You're say, but I'm saying the same old thing. What about this? Why don't you speak in the heavenly language? Why don't you speak in tongues? Why don't you speak in tongues for two to three hours? Mm-hmm. He says, praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. I think that's fantastic when you think about that. There will be times when our prayer utterances will be intense with strong cryings and groanings which cannot be uttered. And there will be times when prayer will be like a chore and a ritual. Hands up who find prayer sometimes a chore and a ritual. Thank God for honest people. And then there's about 800 people here who just don't find prayer a chore and a ritual. It must be really spiritual. Can I hear a praise the Lord? Let's go on. And then... Like our Lord, we are told, as a man, when he entered the garden, it says he prayed more earnestly. Have you ever had seasons like that? (coughs) When you pray more earnestly. And then thirdly, it must be unselfish. That constant praying and intense praying in the Spirit not only be for ourselves, but all for God's people. That is the armor. God wants you to put on this morning. That is the armor God wants you to use. And this is the only armor that will be effective against the powers of darkness. Can I hear a big praise the Lord? Can I hear it again? Your attention has been tremendous. Let me finish with this. And I believe that God has spoken to our hearts this morning. A footnote to close. Did you notice in verse 14, before Paul lists for us all the pieces of God's armor, he says two words, stand therefore. Stand therefore. Will you repeat it after me? In your work tomorrow, stand therefore. In your school tomorrow, stand therefore. Wherever you are tomorrow, stand therefore. Paul expected the lovers of the Lord Jesus to take their stand for him. There are some people who never take a stand. They are always changing their ground. You never know when you have them. And you never know where you have them. They they shift and they budge and they slip and they slide. Life is just a dodging of difficulties and never a magnificent facing of the foe. Brothers and sisters, Christ expects us to face life with its difficulties and problems, not to run away from them. Can I hear a praise the Lord? Christ says, stand there for, face your difficulty, face your, but pastor, it's time, face it, Mm. and face it with the shield of faith, and you'll be amazed at what will happen. Can I hear a praise the Lord? And notice, as I definitely finish, I've been long-winded. No, I haven't really been long-winded. Just, just things just went late this morning. Notice all this armor is for the front. Say the front. There's no armor for the back. The reason is, it's not the will of God for you to turn your back on your troubles and difficulties of life but to face them and master them and turn them around to your advantage. So he says, stand therefore. We've got a wonderful Lord. And we've got a wonderful Lord that equips us. So go home today and read that. And and if you want, get the tape and listen to it again. Just... I just lifted those things out and threw them at you this morning, trying to get through the seven pieces. But take them and use them for the glory of God, but especially that old helmet. 
It keeps you thinking straight. Can I hear a praise the Lord? There's some of you, look at me this morning. You know what's wrong with you? You're not thinking straight. You're thinking it's round the bend. Start thinking straight again because thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stead on thee. Thank you for listening. Can I hear a praise the Lord? Can I hear it again? Hallelujah. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that <coughs> I am God. Be still and He's here this morning. That be still and know that I am God. Be still. Let's bow our heads in the closing seconds. Is there a man here this morning? Is there a woman here this morning? You've listened to God's word. You've been drawn here. Is there a person here this morning who would say, Pastor McConnell, would you remember me in your prayer? Because I'm not right with God, but I would love to be right with God. Is there a person here this morning who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm not right with God. Thank you, lady. Thank you. You may take your hand down. Is there another one this morning? Just to say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not right with God. Is there another one this morning? God bless you, lady. Thank you. God bless you. Is there another one this morning? Quickly, quietly. You're not right with God, but you want to be. That's two. Is there another one this morning? I know the Lord's speaking. Looking at the sides, is there another one this morning? Quickly. Holy Spirit's here. Is there another one this morning? Just slip up your hand, take it down again. Let me see it. Could we sing it while we're making this appeal? Appeal, be still and know. I feel it, there's somebody else. Thank God for the two. Could we sing it? Come on. Be still and know that. Is there another one this morning? Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand and say, Pastor, remember me. Is there another one? Where are you, sir? Where are you, lady? two precious souls and it's lovely to see tears this morning is there another one this morning who oh, I know there is we'll sing it for the final time the Holy Spirit is here this morning be still where are you sir where are you lady just slip up that hand let me see it Holy Spirit's here this morning is there one more is there a backslider this morning is there a backslider this morning just slip up your hand and say I'm coming back to the Lord is there one more God bless you lady God bless you that's wonderful God bless you oh, that's wonderful 
What does God's people say? Is there anybody else? Quickly, please sing it again. Sing it for your own heart. Be still and know. Is there another one this morning? Where are you? Just lift up your hand. Take it down again. I'll see it and pray for you. Where are you? Holy Spirit's here this morning. Is there another one? Come on, where are you? Where are you? He's lovely. That's four. Four people have come to the Lord this morning. What does God's people say? Could we give the Lord the glory this morning? Bless his lovely name. Now those four people, will you put out your hands and we'll all do it with you to encourage you. Are you ready? Gracious and eternal Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I come to thee this morning. Come to thee as a guilty, hell-deserving sinner looking for your mercy, looking for your pardon. Take me as I am and save me for time and eternity. And from this hour, let me serve you with a whole heart and let your name be glorified in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody said, Will you say praise the Lord? It's been a lovely morning. Right from the beginning, it's been a lovely morning. And God bless you, each and every one. It's lovely to have visitors here from France and from the United States and from England. Would you like to give them a wee welcome this morning? God bless you. It's good to see Margaret Boyer back. Looking lovely with her lovely rosette in this morning. Let's welcome her, encourage her. And what we heard rumors that brother... James Coulter. James Coulter, is he here this morning? He was trying to get out. He's been suffering with that cancer in the brain. And it's been amazing, his fight. And uh, we were, if he's listening this morning, telling me, like... Paul mentioned different servants. He was mentioned in dispatches this morning. So God bless him and God encourage him. This is Missionary Sunday. I think Jamesy and Laura's back. Is Jamesy here? Where are you, Jamesy? Is that okay? God bless you. You'll be giving us a brief report tomorrow night at the prayer meeting. And by the way, could I say at the prayer meeting, there will be no healing service in the morning, but there will be a healing service at the prayer meeting tomorrow night because I have business things to do tomorrow. And I want you to come out tomorrow night. We're going to have this healing service tomorrow night and the report and seeking God's face tomorrow night as well in prayer. We thank God for it. Can I hear a praise the Lord? Keep that in mind, won't you? Thank God for his goodness. But as I said, this is Missionary Sunday where we keep faith with Jason and Jolene. They phoned me during the week and so did James and Laura and it's lovely. And uh, let's give this morning. This is Missionary Sunday and would everybody from the oldest to the youngest give a missionary offering for the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. So would you give this morning? Brethren, would you come forward and take our offerings for Kenya, for Ethiopia? And don't forget we help Leroy and Team Challenge. We promised to help them for two years. This is his second year that we're helping him. So just pray that God will undertake and bless. And we're helping other pastors who are working on very slender apparatus. So it's lovely. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Can I hear a praise the Lord? Can I hear it again? Hallelujah. Jesus paid it all. Come on, let's sing it from our hearts. Come on. Jesus.
gets us paid at all All to Him I Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Don't forget tonight, let me encourage you to come out tonight, tonight, and uh, lots of our people are on holiday, and the scouts are down at Crawford's Burn, there's over 40 of them down there, but we're expecting a good turnout tonight, and we're asking you to make that effort, it's the Lord's day, don't be sitting in the house, come out, hear the word of God, I'm going to talk about the worm that God changed into a prince the worm that God changed into a prince. We'll see how it goes. It could be a two-part message, but we're looking forward to that tonight at a quarter to seven. And, uh, and some of the Larn people that get saved are coming up tonight, I understand. So let's pray that the Lord will encourage them. It's been lovely this morning. Let's stand in his presence. Hallelujah. Put your hands out. We'll sing as a benediction in your presence. Are you ready, every brother and every sister? Come on. Give me a prayer. Isn't it lovely this morning that he forgives us? Now, what about you forgiving? All right? Mm -hmm. What about you forgiving? We're forgiven. Now, forgive in return. What is it? Meet us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And forgive us our as. Uh, well, we'll leave that out, don't we? May God lead us on. Say praise God. Ah, but I'm watching him. <laughs> Thank God my master doesn't say, I forgive you, Jim McConnell, but I'm watching you. In fact, he loves me. 
he loves you. Can I hear a praise the Lord? And now may the grace of our Lord, the love of God, the fellowship. Amen. God bless you. Safe home. See you tonight.